from Vietnam. Welcome back to my channel. Since the last video about visa requirements was posted, many of you have asked me how you can buy property, how to invest, and how to even retire in Vietnam. So in today's video, I decided to collaborate with Anh Ken one more time to answer all of those questions. All right, let's go. So just in case you don't know Anh Ken from the last video, can you please introduce yourself to my audience? Yes, so thank you very much for having me back again. Uh, so my name is Ken Yung. I'm an investor, attorney, and also the founding partner of Yung Global. Our company has helped uh, over 100 people get all over the world, live, work, and retire. And I've actually lived here in Vietnam for over 10 years now. And I uh, have a lot of personal experience, but of course we've helped a lot of clients live, work and especially retire in Vietnam and that's what I want to be able to share with your audience today. So a lot of my audience have traveled to Vietnam mm -hmm. and fallen in love with this yep. country and now they work here, they want to build a family and they want to buy property here. Mm -hmm. So can foreigners buy a land or a house in Vietnam and how do they do so? Yes, so as of uh, 2017, uh, the Vietnam law allows for foreigners to buy into and there are specific rules. So what foreigners can't do is they can't buy land mm -hmm. and they can't buy properties attached to the land, what we call villas, um, but they can buy apartments such as this project here, Sung Kim's uh, Metro, Metropole Thu Thiem project or Vin Homes or um, Ba Song or any one of those apartment buildings so they can actually buy those. Um, so they have a 50 year lease uh, with a 50 year extension, so what we call 99 years. Uh, of the property, they can sell it as well. However, as a foreigner, you are only allowed to sell to another foreigner. Okay. You can't sell to a Vietnamese. Also, there are quota restrictions, so only certain percentages, between 30 to 50 percent of each project, are permitted to sell to foreigners because you still want to protect the rights of uh, Vietnamese who want to buy properties as well. Um, and then, um, so you look at the different areas. Uh, so right here, we're at Thu Thiem, uh, which is one of the more up and coming uh, areas, part of Thu Duc City. Um, and then you can look out further out as well. So here, you're looking at about seven to $10,000 per square meter, okay. uh, which is on the higher end. If you go across the river at Ba Song, you're looking at about fifteen to $20,000 per square meter. And then of course, downtown. But then there are other places in District 2, District 9, um, District 5, further away that have very good pricing as well. So I would always re recommend the, um, the viewers uh, of your channel to kind of look and work with a real estate agent in order to uh, look at different places that are more suitable for families, for single people, also for digital nomads. Uh, they have condo tells, have office tells as well. Mm -hmm. So you can actually buy and actually work and live in your property as well and you can actually register a business uh, what we talked about before right uh, so there are many options for foreigners uh, in vietnam there's a special position if you are a big deal many of the audience that i know are big deal one is uh, you can buy property under a vietnamese quota if you can do your certificate of origin that means you were an uh, vietnamese origin you were born in vietnam you have roots to Vietnam, then you can actually buy one property with that certificate. If you want to buy multiple properties under a uh, Vietnamese local, then you would have to get your Vietnamese passport. Uh, as referenced in the video before, uh, if you can qualify to get your Vietnamese passport, your digital family book, and your national ID, then you'd be able to actually own land under the Vietnamese quota. And the reason, the difference between the two is this. If you are a foreigner buying under the foreign quota, you can only sell it to other foreigners. Oh. So you're limited on who you can sell it to. If you're buying under the Vietnamese quota, you can sell to a foreigner or a local. So therefore you have much more options as a local buyer as opposed to a foreign buyer. And those are generally the rules regarding real estate ownership for foreigners in Vietnam. All right, Ken, so I see there are a lot of new buildings are rising up and it looks like the Vietnam real estate market is thriving. So what's your opinion in the Vietnam real estate outlook? So if you look at uh, kind of the general landscape uh, of the real estate, it's broken down into three segments. 
you have the what's called the uh, lower uh, middle segment which is about 2,500 per square meter or less then you have the middle segment which is 2,500 to uh, 5,000 per square meter and then you have the super uh, luxury which is 5,000 and above and of course there are also projects that are 25,000 per square meters uh, but of course uh, reasonably priced uh, is between 75 to 100 per square meter where people can afford, they can live. There's been an excess supply of uh, real estate projects in all segments. Uh, and also due to the COVID situation, the demand has diminished a lot. Uh, and also with the banking allowing people to borrow money. So unfortunately right now, the foreigners are not permitted to borrow money in order to buy real estate in Vietnam. Uh, there is a company called Homebase that allows to uh, possible lending. So some of the clients can look into that as well to buy properties here and get a loan to buy it. But uh, for the most part, uh, you have to have your cash available and ready to buy in Vietnam. So I, I see there, the pricing has not gone down yet. Okay. So I don't think if you're gonna wait a little bit longer that the price will get better because there are more projects coming out. Uh, and there's also demand from foreigners that are buying here in Vietnam, both Hanoi, Saigon, and right. many of the provinces. But can foreigners invest into real estate here in Vietnam? Yes, so based on the, there are a lot of foreigners. So uh, based on the statistics, roughly about 20% of all the properties uh, that are bought in uh, Saigon uh, are owned by foreigners. Oh. So Hong Kong, Taiwanese, Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans are some of the bigger Asian investors. And then, of course, uh, Europeans, uh, Americans, and Australians are buying into and investing into Vietnam. Uh, you got to take a look at the cap rate or the return uh, on investment based on rental rates. So right now, Vietnam, or at least uh, Saigon and Hanoi, the purchase price is way too high per square meter compared to the rental rate. Okay. So the rental rate gives you what's called the cap rate is your cash flow based on rental. So you take the uh, cash flow uh, divided by the purchase price will get you your what's called a cap rate or rate of return. So right now, you, if you get a loan or you put out cash and it just doesn't make sense for you to buy a property that's more than 300,000 US dollars. Right. If you get something less and you can rent it out sufficient for you to pay your uh, loan, or to make enough money to pay for that property. Uh, anything above that, then the cap rate is way too low for you to invest into real estate in Vietnam. It's probably better if they put into a cash deposit or a savings account in their own country and they'll get three to four percent there. Okay, that's really good advice. And uh, we were just talking about real estate, buying a house, buying a land here. And now we're gonna talk about how to open a business in Vietnam. And with that topic, Let's get back to the office and we discuss more. Great. All right, Ken, so how can people open a business here in Vietnam? So um, I want to be able to separate it because it's quite complex regarding what country you're from, what citizenship. So I'll keep the two simple ways is as a foreign company opening in Vietnam and then as a local company, if you have uh, joint venture partners or you can, uh, what's called a legal nominee agreement. So as a foreign company, a foreign individual wanting to open a company in Vietnam, first you have to look at whether that industry is restricted. Uh, so there's a World Trade Organization uh, commitments that Vietnam has signed on to that opens up a lot more areas. And then also there are US-Vietnam bilateral trade agreements and then the ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, the EU-Vietnam. So these treaties will open up more areas but then Vietnam also has restricted areas. So first you gotta look if your industry that you wanna open is restricted or not. And if it is restricted, um, for example, the film industry, you can't have more than 51% of a movie production company because it deals with content um, and it deals with the censorship board. Uh, another area is a certain infrastructure project, oil projects uh, that you can't do. But most of the general areas are permitted. Okay. All right, so you look at the area. Then the second one is you got to look at how you plan to um, contribute your capital contribution into the business. 
if you're transferring from abroad or transferring it within Vietnam, then you have to show that that money is there. Mm. The third thing is deciding which entity is best for you. Is it going to be a representative office, if it's a limited liability company, or a corporation and there are different purposes. Of course, that goes into very detailed uh, for you to um, determine which entity. And then finally, location. Should you open in Hanoi or should you open in Da Nang or Saigon? Depending on where your resources are, where the talent is that you plan to hire, and also uh, looking at tax implications and the ease of work. Mm, okay. okay. So how much is the minimum to open a business here in Vietnam? And what's the tax obligation? Okay. So for the capital contribution of the business, uh, there's an outline depending what industries that you plan to do. Uh, so um, in the US, we call it the doctrine of ultra virus, which means that if you will list all the industries that you plan to do, um, content creation or social media, import, export, distribution, restaurants and all that. Um, so the more that you have on your list of industries, each one will have its own capital contribution requirement. Okay. Then you add all that up, then you can um, uh, open the business. But one of the easiest businesses that have very, very low capital contribution is a consulting company. Oh. General business consulting company that requires $1,000 to open. Uh, there are many other businesses that require zero dollars. Uh, one of the tougher ones, uh, the film industry for example, is you have to have to have a hundred thousand investment and also you have to have fifty thousand dollar bond okay uh, as well and then of course import export so it's hard to say the exact amount but there are some industries that you don't have to put any capital contribution and still open the business okay can you give us an example of like what kind of in industry that we don't have to put in a lot of money uh, so what uh, software development for example okay. if you were going to write software in vietnam that one doesn't require. Uh, you know, on, on the sense of um, content creation, if you're really a freelance writer, for example, mm -hmm. uh, for Fiverr or one of those uh, independent uh, contractor type of uh, freelance work, then if you're just purely doing a, a digital nomad, content creation around the world, but you're based here, mm -hmm. you one is you might not have to even form a company, and then two is if you do form, uh, it would be no required capital contribution for you, uh, just purely content creation. And how about the taxes? So the taxes are uh, under the Vietnam system and then it depends on which country you're from. If your country of citizenship has worldwide taxes or not, like the United States, um, some other countries around the world, others have territorial tax. So first you gotta look at what your tax requirements are in your country and then for the taxes in Vietnam. So I will talk generally about what the tax requirements of a business are uh, and then uh, we'll possibly talk about some of the details depending on the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, so the main requirement for you is if you when you bring in capital contribution into Vietnam that is not taxable okay and that's not considered revenue that is called investment into the business. Uh, when you pull that money out or you sell the business for a gain or a profit then you have to pay taxes on those shares. Um, another one is you have to pay, pay your corporate tax if you form a corporation or limited liability company. Uh, right now in Vietnam, it's 25% for corporate tax. Um, if you pay out dividends uh, to yourself here in Vietnam as a local employee or as a foreign employee, it's treated differently. If you hire yourself as a foreign employee working in Vietnam, then you will be what's called a tax withholding between 10 to 20 percent. If you treat yourself as a, a local working here, then you'll be subjected to personal income tax like everybody else. Uh, you have to pay employment taxes uh, based on your employees. Um, so there are two ways to do it. If you have an independent contractor, then you don't have to withhold taxes. If you are an actual or your employees or Vietnamese people under a full-time employment contract, then you have to pay social security benefits for them, uh, also bảo hiểm xã hội insurance for them, and then uh, the salary. Then you got to think about the 13 month salary as well. Those, and then of course the taxes related to that. Finally, if you're a corporation, then you will be double taxed. Uh, that means you pay taxes on your corporate uh, profits, 
And then after that, you can either do retained earnings, which means you keep the money inside the corporation, you don't have to pay. But if you pay out dividends to your shareholders, then the shareholders will pay taxes on their ordinary income. Uh, they'll have to report the taxes in Vietnam based on the corporate laws. And then they might have to pay taxes in their home country if there's no double tax treaty between the two countries. So that's something you should definitely look into in order to determine what your tax implications are as a foreigner doing business in Vietnam. Wow, so there are a lot of tax obligations. Ah, there's one more taxes, okay. the VAT. So the value added tax as a service or a product uh, typically is 10%. But right now, um, there are many industries that are, are uh, being hit by COVID. So the government has lowered it to 8%. Uh, for, for many of the industries um, for the VAT. So normally as a company, you would charge the VAT to the actual uh, consumer. Uh, you would put it on top of your price. If you don't, then you're losing eight to 10% on your profits. Uh, and then they have to issue you a red invoice. So understanding the red invoice system, much different than many of the developing countries. It's similar to China, similar to some of the developing countries. So look at understanding the red invoice system. Um, here in Vietnam to understand how to pay taxes, how to deduct taxes, and fulfill your tax obligations. Okay, so I see there are a lot of tax obligations that people need to look out for. And thank you so much, Ken, because I think it's super informative for uh, our audience. And it seems like it's um, all about the obligations. Now we're going to move to another fun part, which is retirement. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to a coffee shop and do this uh, Part, talking more about how people can retire here in Vietnam. All right, moving to the next part. We're gonna talk about retiring in Vietnam, so that's why we choose a coffee shop, a chill place to talk about this topic now. Uh, so in Ken, since moving back, I saw that Vietnam has so much potential, and I think it's the best place to work, invest, and eventually retire here. So my question is that, what are the reasons people should retire in Vietnam? So if you can see from before, people looked at Thailand or Malaysia or even Singapore, but it's too expensive now. But Vietnam has a few really amazing points of why I think it's great to retire. One is the cost of living is still relatively inexpensive. You have uh, great access to uh, great medical care. As a retiree, that's very important. Uh, also, uh, regarding the energy. So Vietnam, 70% are under 35 years old and 50% under 30. So therefore, you always see in constant young energy, vibrant, willing to learn. So that one always uh, helps retirees keep uh, fresh and young. But finally also, there's businesses that retirees can run that actually don't need for them to be actively participating, such as a coffee shop or a small restaurant or even a uh, small bungalow or hotel in a beachside resort. All of those factors will help a retiree find that uh, retiring in Vietnam is very cost effective, enjoyable, and they can spend their time and their days enjoying the beach, the mountains, and of course, the hustle and bustle of the city as well. Wow, that's awesome. So like, if people want to retire here in Vietnam, how can they do that? So currently right now, they don't have a retirement visa like Thailand or uh, in Malaysia whereby you just need to show you have enough money in your bank account uh, and uh, you have certain monthly income to support yourself. So it's like two to three thousand dollars. Vietnam doesn't have that right now, so we advise a few options for retirees. Uh, one is they can get a very simple investor visa under the DT4 category we talked about, uh, less than $140,000. So we, we have a very simple GS25 convenience store franchise that they can invest in. It's absentee owner. Uh, the franchisor runs everything. So that's one way to get your one-year visa and just renew it every single uh, year. That's awesome. Uh, there's a guaranteed return and then also a buyback provision as well. That's one way to do it. The second way, and many retirees, is they try to find their true love. So maybe a second or a third chance of finding your true love here in Vietnam. Uh, somebody who is uh, could be your lover, could be your friend, but also could be your caretaker as well, right? Uh, as we age, uh, we need someone to take care of us. Right.
both for medical and non-medical needs. So to have somebody younger, a little bit more vibrant, who has the mentality of taking care of their partners, that's also a benefit here because you can get somebody um, for relatively inexpensive uh, to take care of you. But if they're your lover, that's, that's even better. Right. And if they're your friend, that's even better to have a companion as we age with grace and enjoy our retirement. Okay, yeah. And especially in Vietnam, uh, most of people are very family-oriented. And I think Vietnam is the best country to have like such a strong sense of community here. Mm -hmm. So um, if people can retire here, I think it's going to be very good for both of their mental health and their physical health. Yeah. Yes, yes, I definitely agree. And in the city, uh, maybe less so, uh, because they're big cities, people are busy, they're here to make money and work and go to school. But if you look at smaller cities like Hoi An, Right. Đà Nẵng, Đà Lạt, uh, even Cần Thơ, Hà Long Bay, Sapa. So many of those smaller cities, people are much more close-knit. Time is more relaxed. Right. Cost of living is lower. And of course, you have the amazing beaches, the amazing um, mountains, yes. and the scenery, and right some far. of them, the weather is even better. Yeah. So many retirees choose not to be in the big city, and they get everything they need in uh, a smaller uh, city. So what are the things that you need to consider if you want to retire in Vietnam? So we get a lot of questions asked about insurance uh, and also social security benefits, right. especially as a European or an American. So with the insurance, uh, you can have your coverage in your home country, get the international extension to that coverage, see what that covers and which countries. And then also I would highly recommend that you get a international insurance carrier in Vietnam such as uh, Manulife or Prudential or AIA or some of the bigger companies. So you make sure that you have your Vietnam coverage and also Southeast Asia coverage, which is called expat health insurance. Um, Vietnam right now can cover all the general needs, uh, checkups, uh, dialysis, cancer treatments or chemotherapy. But when you, some of the larger procedures such as heart surgery or open brain surgery, then it might be better to go to Singapore, which has a very advanced right. uh, healthcare system and insurance uh, policy as well. So I highly recommend to put in place your insurance, both your health and your life and medical insurance plan before you come to Vietnam and decide to retire for good here in Vietnam. Uh, the second consideration is as an American or European, you will have retirement benefits or social security benefits. So how do you transfer that to Vietnam uh, or you can transfer directly through your consulate or embassy in your home country. So you can contact your embassy and ask them, how can I receive my monthly retirement and social security benefits here in Vietnam and what are my tax requirements for that? So having those two things, I think, in place and organized, then it will make your retirement much more um, uh, stress-free and also you have a peace of mind just to enjoy uh, your retirement. So I think another factor that makes people decide to come to Vietnam and eventually retire here is the cost of living. And uh, we're not going to cover it in today's video because Ken Yung makes a lot of videos about that and I make a lot of videos about that. So we're going to leave the link right here or right there so you guys can check it out. So yeah, thank you so much and Ken for being here and that's it for the video today. If you have any questions, don't forget to fill out the form in the description below. Alright, we'll see you in the next one. Bye!